Welcome to my dining room, or as I've been calling it for the last year, the map room. Oh, before I forget, on that previous image of all those maps, if you're not of a certain age, you might not be aware, it used to be that if you went to any gas station, anywhere in the United States service station, uh, they would give you for free a map of all the roads in that state to help you navigate because there really weren't any electronic resources back then to get from town to town or from state to state. So that's what that picture was, a bunch of those old maps uh, given out by gas stations to help you navigate. Today, I'm going to be talking about all my decisions that went into planning this route and the resources that I've been using to figure out how I'm going to pull this off. One thing I want to mention right up front, I'm going to be changing this route probably day to day as I make the actual trip, depending on the weather, depending on what local folks say is the best way to go, depending on how I feel. But I've got it roughly mapped out, and I think generally this is what I'm going to do. But let me tell you a little bit about why I decided to do it the way I'm doing it. As you know from the last video, I decided I wanted to ride my bike from coast to coast. Decision one, east to west or west to east. I decided west to east was probably best, partly because that way I'd have the prevailing winds at my back. And if you're a cyclist at all, you know how important the wind can be. Headwinds suck. This is also a cool way to go because once I get past the middle of Wyoming, things are pretty much downhill from there. They really are. The bad things about going west to east are that I won't have been trained up very well at the very beginning of the ride, and that's going to be by far the hardest part of the ride. Getting through Oregon, Idaho, and the first half of Wyoming crossing the Rockies, that's going to be tough, and that's not when I'm going to be at my fittest. But I'll have that behind me after the first month or so of the trip. I looked at other tour routes. Um, I'll go over the resources I used to find all those other routes. Some are just too mountainous. Some actually took me, believe it or not, bike routes on interstate highways because in parts of Wyoming, that's the only way to get there. And the thought of being on a bike on an interstate highway where the speed limit is 75 and there's a double trailer tractor going past me, the vortex would be incredible. Um, anyway, so none of those. I looked at routes going south like San Diego over to Florida. Those seemed a little too boring to me. Um, it's about a thousand miles shorter to go that way, and I didn't want to take any shortcuts. And just generally, I thought the northern-ish route that I've picked would show me a lot of sites that I haven't seen before that I thought would be way more interesting to me. The south was also probably going to be too hot. Now, the route that I'm going has me crossing the Midwest in July and August, and I know there are going to be nights when I'm laying in my tent and it's 90 degrees and humid, and I'm just wishing that dawn would come so I could get back on my bike because I'm probably not going to get much sleep on some of those nights. But that would have been even worse going across Texas. Whew. Still, every week or so or 10 days, I hope to be in a hotel or some sort of civilized shelter. I'll talk a lot more about those in another video um, to get a break from the heat. <clears throat> I went on, I looked at a lot of organized tour rides, particularly adventure cycling rides. I'll talk more about them. And I got some ideas from some of their routes, but they tend to be way more on pavement that I want to be. I want to avoid traffic whenever possible. And I'll show you a lot of the ways that I've come up with to avoid being on roads, being with traffic for more than half of this ride all the way across the country. Um, when? When will I be starting? I looked at a lot of meteorological sites once I had a route roughly picked out and decided that I don't want to be going across the Rockies when there's much of a likelihood of snow. So my plan is to start in early June when it's very unlikely that I'm going to hit any snow slush on the roads. That really sucks when you're out cycling. I don't mind snow on my tent. Actually, I kind of like it. Um, but I don't want to be trying to ride a bicycle when there's slush, snow, ice anywhere near where I'm going to be going. Um, I probably could have done it a bit earlier now that I'm looking at more up-to-date forecasts, but early June seems like a reasonable thing to do. Still, um, with climate change, you've seen what the weather's been like out in California for the last few months. The incredible rain that they've been having, that snow melt is going to impact parts of this trip probably. And who knows what's going to be happening through the Midwest this summer with severe weather of all different sorts. But 
that's the way it is in the days of climate change. I think this will be my best shot at making it livable. Uh, I've got a little experience in biking and living in such climates. I lived in Phoenix for three years, loved cycling in Phoenix and got used to cycling when it's 100 degrees. You just need to carry a lot of water and start early when you can. I lived in the Washington DC area for 30 plus years and it's hot and humid a lot of the year in DC. So I've had my taste of humidity. I know what to expect. I've done a tremendous amount of bike packing and camping in DC, Tennessee, where it's hot and humid in the summer. I can deal with that. But again, as I said, the nights are gonna be tough. Okay, <clears throat> let me show you some of the resources that I've been using as I planned this trip. Let me get this out of the way in a hurry. Um, this is a map from publicradioatlas.org of all the PBS stations and where they are, where their coverage areas are in each state that I expect to be traveling. So I'll be listening to a lot of NPR news, talk shows, that kind of stuff to keep me a little bit up to date and entertained on my trip. And that's again, publicradioatlas.org. Again, everything that I talk about will be down in the description below with links to things like this. So I'm planning to have a little radio with me um, for use in my tent. And even when I'm not in the middle of traffic with my AirPods cruising across the country. <laughs> As I said, I've done a lot of backpacking in my day. So I've already accumulated a lot of national park maps here in Nashville, the Natchez Trace National Park. I've spent so much time in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. I have camped and hiked all over it. Um, Fort McHenry, Baltimore. Mount Rainier, wow, that was awesome. Uh, the Shenandoah National Park where my sons grew up and I've spent so much time camping. Uh, Prince William National Forest. Uh, Denali, boy, I wish I could be there this summer, but that's a little bit big of a hill for me and a little bit out of the way, but that was a great visit. And the Appalachian Trail, which I mentioned earlier, was something that I'd hoped I might do this year, but not. So none of these parks for which I already have the maps um, will be helped to me this summer. But these maps are wonderfully detailed in terms of where the trails are, what the terrain's like, all that sort of stuff. So whenever I am anywhere near a national park or other park for which there's a great map, I will be picking those up and using them. Another great mapping resource, um, I'd say even better than those gas station maps I just talked about. I reached out to the tourism departments. I didn't know that's where I would find them until I did some research of every state that I'll be traversing. And they all sent me their official up-to-date um, 2021, in this case for Oregon, highway maps. And these maps for every state that I'll be traversing, um, there you go. It's every significant map, road, whatever in those states. This one happens to be Oregon. And almost all of them also have city maps of the most important towns in our cities in that state. So I've got all of those. I have not been using these in my actual planning very much, um, but I will be carrying them with me in case I run out of signal, run out of battery, run out of whatever, and need to go old school. So I got those from, here's the Portland city map, Idaho, Wyoming, South Dakota. That's going to be a couple of little detours, Missouri, Illinois, Ohio, etc. cetera. Um, before I forget it, the reason I mentioned a slight detour to South Dakota, I'm going to be heading across Nebraska and I've got a couple of detours planned. One, I've never been to Yellowstone. There's a national park map to pick up. So I'm going to spend a couple days going up off trail into Yellowstone to see that for my first time. I've heard it can be really hard biking because of all the traffic, but I really want to see a bit of Yellowstone. And also, um, I read a book a long time ago called Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee about the Native Americans and their plight, and especially about the battle at Wounded Knee. So I want to take a little detour up into South Dakota to visit, to visit that site, and I hope camp one night there, and then get back on the trail, but that's a little bit more South Dakota. Um, <clears throat> also, as I've been online looking at every state, many states have actual bike trail maps. This is the one for Illinois. The sad news is Illinois' routes go north-south, or they're up around Chicago, Chicago, 
and I'll be going east west or west east down here. There ain't nothing. Um, so I'll be going roads down there. But it's useful to have these state by state bike trails, if for nothing else, to know I'm not looking for something that's not there. There just aren't any bike trails going west east in southern Illinois. Um, there's a thing called the East Coast Greenway, which goes all the way from Maine down to, I think, Florida. There'll be one little stretch of that that I'll be on from um, up near D.C. through Richmond, where my son Daniel lives, and then down all the way to Virginia Beach, where I hope to dip my tire in the Atlantic Ocean at the end of the trip. Yeehaw! Um, but the East Coast Greenway uh, is also a cool resource and has some really neat routes that I didn't realize were there in the Tidewater area of Virginia. So I'm looking forward to that. Again, links down below to all this stuff. When I get to Ohio, they have got a really cool bike path all mapped out called the Ohio to Erie Trail, which starts in Cincinnati on the Ohio River and goes all the way up to Lake Erie near Cleveland or in Cleveland. I'll be taking that almost all the way across Ohio and it avoids almost all the roads. It's almost all bike trails, not pavement. I'm really excited about that. I've talked to some friends that have done it. I've seen a lot of YouTube videos of people doing it. This is going to be a great way to get across Ohio. I've lived in Youngstown, Cleveland, Columbus, and so spent a lot of time in Ohio. So I'm really looking forward to seeing some old places, seeing some old friends, and using this to get across Ohio. Once I get up around Maslin, I'll be leaving the Ohio to Erie Trail and going pretty much straight east over to Pittsburgh to catch the Allegheny Gap Trail. And that'll be kind of the mapping and exploring that I've been talking about otherwise. One of the resources that is just going to be so wonderful is Rails to Trails. What? Well, since about 1960, there's been a movement afoot to convert old railroad beds into multi-use flat trails for walking, hiking, and biking. And <clears throat> let me get these numbers right. There are now over 25,000 miles in the U.S. with over 2,000 trails of converted railroads into multi-use trails for things like biking. I'm going to be using the heck out of those. Um, and there's also a few other things that are close to that, like the CNO Canal Trail that I'll be doing, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal Trail that went from the Ohio River to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and that old canal footpath has now been converted to a bikeway, which I've heard can be pretty sloppy at some times, but it seems like the best way to go. And again, avoiding traffic. That's kind of like Rails to Trails, but something similar. Rails to Trails is now a nonprofit organization. Join, donate, I do. Um, they even have a magazine that talks about all the latest developments in converting rails to trails, and it's really neat. Um, trails Day was April 23rd of this year. So I'll be doing more than half of my ride off-road on these rails to trails. That's going to make it so much nicer than being on highways with vehicle traffic the whole way. I'm going to have to do a lot of that, but considerably less than half because of this. <clears throat> Another resource that uses some of those rails to trails is the Adventure Cycling Organization. These folks organize a lot of those expensive bike tours that I've been talking about. I've talked to folks that love them and do them year after year. For me, they're just a little expensive, and I want to be either by myself or just myself and Michael Hull for this trip. So I won't be doing an organized ride, but Adventure Cyclist, adventurecycling.org, um, link below, they uh, do have maps that they sell, and I've ordered a couple of their maps, and I think they're going to be useful. And they have a lot of tips for just general biking and bike camping, bike packing, that sort of thing. So Adventure Cyclist, that organization. Um, let's see. Oh, another resource that I plan to use a lot is um, bike shops. Wherever I go, I'm going to go to a bike shop, if there is one, and just ask, What's the best way to get from here to the next stop? And wherever possible, I'll buy some stuff from them to tune up my bike, clean my bike, maybe get some electrolytes and that sort of stuff to help me get to the next towns. The first three states are going to be really sparse in terms of any resources at all, Oregon, Idaho, Wyoming. Once I get out of Portland, maybe Eugene, 
uh, the high desert of Oregon. I'm going to be going days. We're going to be going days, Michael and me, without any access to towns. There may be a couple of little general stores, but I can't count on them. And water is even going to be a little bit sparse. So I'm going to have to plan really carefully for water, carrying water, filtering water along the way, that sort of thing. Idaho, not as bad. Wyoming gets bad again. Once I get past Wyoming and get to Nebraska, from there on out, there's going to be an awful lot of abilities to stop at little whistle stop towns, go to the general store, get some groceries. Once I get to the Midwest, there's water everywhere. That won't really be an issue once I get at least past Nebraska. And even Nebraska, there's quite a bit of resources there. But Wyoming, Idaho, Oregon, those are going to be tough. One other thing that has been a little bit of use to me, not a lot, but was kind of interesting. Um, when I ordered all those state highway maps that I talked about, every state sent me their official visitor guide. Um, so if you want to do touristy things in Missouri, Ohio, um, happy traveler, this, uh, Pennsylvania, Wyoming, Idaho, Nebraska, uh, Eastern Oregon, South Dakota, you get a lot of those when you order those maps. And they're lo worth looking through, but they're not much use to tra uh, planning a bike trip. Um, the other resource that I want to use, if you'd be so kind, if you have any ideas about trails I should be taking, resources I should be stopping at along the way, I'll be talking about a thing called warm showers, which is something I expect to use to get out of the weather every now and then. But if you have any ideas, please make comments below. I will read every bit of that, respond to you. I'd really appreciate any help that you might offer in that regard. Okay. That's everything I had to say about all the resources that I've come up with in terms of mail, print materials, that sort of stuff. Now let's move on to everything that I've been doing with online websites and other technology to plan the trip. Here we go. First, an app called Ride with GPS. This is what it looks like when I'm sitting in my bike saddle looking down at it, but that's not how I'll be planning the ride. Now I've opened the app and I want to use it to take me on a bike ride from the Dairy Queen in Portland, Tennessee, all the way up to Auburn, Kentucky. So I type in Dairy Queen, Portland, Tennessee, and click on it. And there it is, so I click on it. And it'll put a little pin right where that Dairy Queen is. I say start route, and now I will decide how I wanna get across town. So I'll click on the individual streets that I want it to take me on, turn by turn, until I'm through this little part of town and I can change, edit any of this that I might want. And once I'm through this part of town, all the way up there to Russell Street, now I'll just type in Auburn, Kentucky, and I'll let it figure out the rest of the way to go from there. So I type in Auburn and there's Kentucky. So I'll click on that and it automatically route to there takes me there. So there's 32 miles automatically laid in. This is one of my favorite places to ride. So I know this is basically the route I do want to take, but I'd tweak it a little bit and I can see that it's not put me on most of the major roads. This is a good way to get from Portland, Tennessee up to Auburn, Kentucky using Ride with GPS to get me there. Once I've created my ride, downloaded it to my phone, then I just hit navigate when I'm ready to start pedaling and it gives me turn by turn directions all the way to my destination. When I'm done, I hit record, record ride, it saves it, and then if I want, I can call it up and look at it later to see how I've done, forward it to somebody else, post it on social media, whatever. Let's say that somebody's crazy enough to do something a little more extreme, maybe riding all the way from the Pacific Ocean. Here's the beach where I'm expecting to start, right outside Florence, Oregon. And now all the way over to, let's enter Virginia Beach, Virginia and let it calculate a route all the way across country. Here we are at the other ocean, and here's our route now. <laughs> Let's zoom out and take a look at the whole thing. Here's the way it wants me to go, including all the elevation profiles and everything else. Of course, this is not the route I'm going to take. It's not a bad route, but it's certainly not what I'm going to do. But it'll give you an idea of how you can go from a local route all the way to cross country using Ride with GPS the most important tool or program that I'll be using on this ride. But there are a lot of other resources. Let me touch on a few of those briefly. Here, for instance, is the Adventure Cycling Association. They have routes all over the country that they use for their organized bike tours. 
Uh, and also those routes are available for purchase by people like me as very detailed maps explaining resources and that sort of thing. Sadly, they don't cover most of the route that I want to take on this trip. They've been curating their own coast-to-coast -coast route for quite some years. Here's an image of that. Here's another app that I've been using quite a bit. It's called Komoot. And it's quite a bit like Ride with GPS in that you just give it a starting point and a finish point, and it will automatically prepare a route for you, which you can then adjust more to your liking after the fact. It's used worldwide, probably more than in the U.S. It's like Ride with GPS in that the more a particular little piece of a route has been taken, the more likely it is to be recommended to you. These are called heat maps. It's a little bit different than Ride with GPS in that it has a lot of points of interest like campsites and restaurants and general stores, which can really help you out along the way, and it has reviews of those. So I've been using Komoot quite a bit to help plan this ride. For instance, I asked it to help me find a water source near but not in Bend, Oregon, and it immediately popped up Sandy Point Beach and says that it is recommended by three out of three road cyclists, and with a click, it will make a slight detour from my route to take me right to Sandy Point Beach. Before I get to the last tool that I've been using so much, let me mention that if you're doing this in collaboration with someone else, it's a great idea to project the image from your laptop or iPad or phone or whatever it is that you're using up onto a big screen. It really helps with collaboration. So when Michael and I have been doing this together, I often shoot the image up onto my TV where we can see it together and talk about it without being hunched over together over a small screen. The last tool that I've been using, and quite a lot, is Google. And that goes all the way from the regular Google Maps that we're all familiar with for figuring out how to get to the grocery store to the satellite map, which you see here, of that local bike ride that I was doing up in Portland, Tennessee, and also Google Streets, which allows me to look right down at ground level on whatever street I'm thinking about routing our bike path on. Uh, it's great anytime we're in a place that's civilized enough to have Google Streets. Of course, I hope that we're going to be off-road enough that we are going to be in a lot of areas where we won't have this available. It's been quite a handicap not having it available as I've been trying to figure out how to best get us across the Oregon high desert. Here's a great example of how useful Google can be. When I was trying to plan a route from the Pacific Ocean over to Eugene, Oregon, I noticed that there was almost no way to get around this tunnel. So I went to Google Street View to see how bad it would be. Is there a bike lane through the tunnel? Well, it turns out it's pretty scary, and I'm not sure how I'm going to get around it. If you have any ideas, please post them in the comments below before June of 2023. Anyway, that's uh, been a very useful aspect of Google. And finally, Google Earth VR. This is so cool. Please excuse my bald head, but um, I am now near Florence, Oregon, heading south. The ocean is to my right. There are mountains to my left. Oh my gosh, they're beautiful. And I'm seeing this in real 3D. It's really breathtaking. Um, and I'm gonna be using this to help me plan out my route. So if I get down closer to the street where it's actually useful, I can start basically biking down the road. I can see there's a pretty good shoulder here. Um, can't tell how clean it is from this. I'll show you how I could in just a moment. But I could see what it would be like to be going down this road on my bicycle. Now I might be looking for a place to camp. So let's say, oh, there's a place over to the left. That looks like some place I might be able to camp. Um, nothing big over to the right. No big busyness around here. This looks like a candidate place. So how do I know whether this might be a good place to camp? Well, let's go to Street View. So now I can see the entrance right there, straight ahead of me. That's where that place was, and these bushes give it a lot of cover. So that's probably a pretty good place to camp. Nobody's likely to see me. Man, the 3D view is just awesome. The colors, the depth of everything is just awesome. And I'm at street view, so now I can see that this shoulder is a little dirty, but it's probably a pretty good shoulder for biking. I don't see any big potholes or anything like that along this shoulder. This is probably a good area for biking. Um, soft shoulder over there, it gets a little sandy. And there's a good place to camp. So back to my road, 
and I can cruise as fast as I want to cruise to check this out and look for turns. And there are places up ahead where I can see where there's a climbing lane going up a mountain. So I know that's going to be steep. But this is a way to get beyond just your normal Google Maps and have a 3D look at what's going on and help decide my route using my Oculus. Of course, I can't have this with me on the trip, but it's good for planning ahead of time before I actually go on the trip. That's it. If you're still here at the end of this long video, thanks for sticking with me. That's how I've been planning my ride. Well, except for Strava and Map My Ride and a few other tools. Um, but this is where I've ended up as of today. There should be a map there. See it? Okay. Subject to a lot of tweaks along the way. I'm going to be adjusting every day. By far, the hardest part to plan and to ride is Oregon, Idaho, and Wyoming. Hard to plan because there's just not much cycling there except on the Oregon coast and cities. And it's hard to ride out there and it's a low population density. So I'm not going to be following in the paths of many other cyclists the way I will be on the whole rest of the country. Speaking of the path, I've got a question for you. On a lot of the other sites that I've been following, I see these cyclists with these cool animated maps showing their progress down South America, across Europe, whatever. And I haven't been able to figure out how to do one of those cool maps. Got any ideas? If you do, please post it down in the comments below. Next time, I promise a much shorter toast on my favorite subject, the tech that I'll be using on this ride. And there's quite a bit of it. If you found this video at all useful or interesting, please like and subscribe. And thanks for watching this long video. Have a great day.